Good morning, everyone, and welcome to St Peter's this morning. I was going to say um, what a lovely morning we've got this morning after yesterday and the wonderful autumn sunshine, but unfortunately, I've had to scrap that. Um, but I'm just thinking, I hope you're having a good weekend, apart from the weather so far. And if there are any educators in our midst, or those who go to school or anything college or anything like that, only five more days till half term. If that doesn't affect you, don't worry. It's only about 10 weeks until the Christmas break. So something to look forward to. So we'll start this morning with a prayer. <coughs> Heavenly Father, be with us this morning as we meet to praise you. Let us be open to your words and give us the guidance to be able to understand the true meaning of your ways. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And we'll start by singing our praises to God with our first hymn, which is uh, an old classic, uh, one of my favourites, and it's At the Name of Jesus. So please stand and sing. about being Jesus being the King of Glory but we've also got to remember what he actually did in our reading and um, this morning uh, from Colossians I'm just going to pinch a bit of it now it says for by him all things were created things in heaven and on earth visible and invisible whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities all things were created by him and for him and that leads us on to the children's slot, which is where they're going to be looking at, through his power, all things were made. Everything that we see, the weather, 
you can see most of it this morning, the trees, the us, everything, things we can see, things we can't see, he made. So that's what the children are going to be looking at this morning. Through his power, all things are made. But before we go, we'll have a, our next song. Um, a new one, I think. I'm not sure whether we've sung it before, but hopefully you'll recognise the tune. And it's, we've got the uh, group of people who will be able to guide you if you're not sure. Yet. And it's called The Splendour of the King. So if you can please stand and sing.
Okay, we've now come to that time where we have time of reflection. We know we are all sinners and have sinned this week, but yet we still do it. However, we know that God gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to take away our sin when he died on the cross. Let us now confess our sins to God by saying, if you've got the mission phrase at the bottom of page one, but it will also appear on the screen behind me. So together we say, Almighty and most merciful Father, we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed our own ways and the desires of our own hearts. We have offended you by breaking your holy laws. We have left undone what we ought to have done, and we have done what we ought not to have done. And you have every right to be angry with us. Yet, Father, have mercy on us, pitiful sinners. Restore those who truly repent, according to your promises declared to mankind in Jesus Christ our Lord. And grant for his sake that we may live a godly and obedient life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. And God has given us this fantastic assurance that our Heavenly Father has promised to forgive all those who sincerely turn to him. He has mercy on each one of us, delivers us from our sins and strengthens us for his service through Jesus. Amen. I would now like to invite Andy up to lead us in our time of prayer. Let's pray. Loving God, as the season of autumn settles, may the darker days remind us to take time to seek your seek, the, seek illumination in your word. And may the changing colours of the leaves remind us of the wonder of your creation. Lord God, as we come before you, we give you thanks for providing us with so much to enjoy in our world. Open our eyes to see the beauty around us, and may we be mindful to treat our world with care and respect. Loving God, we pray for your church throughout the world. We pray for justice and peace between and within nations. We pray for political leaders and all in authority, and for the communities in which they work. May they be worthy of their authority and work to help the suffering and the oppressed. And we think especially this morning and we give thanks for the life of Sir David Amos, his life of service. And we pray for his family and ask that you will show them your love after his brutal murder. And we pray for all of our political leaders and ask that you'll protect them and our democracy from harm. Lord God, we mourn our separation from you. We have forsaken your calling to be good custodians of this planet and we're using its resources without considering the future. We are wasteful and we desecrate your world with rubbish and waste. And as we live comfortable lives, we turn our cheek to poverty, injustice, famine and suffering. Some of our leaders and multinational corporations put profit before the well-being of people. We pray that our words and actions may be a witness to uh, world leaders encouraging and inspiring them to make bold commitments in the forthcoming climate talks. Commitments that will restore the earth and lead to justice for communities confronted by the harsh realities of climate crisis. May the leaders of our time, leaders on a new path to a sustainable future, 
where we can live in harmony with all life. We pray for the people we know who don't have good influences in their lives and who love wrong things. We pray for those who allow money or possessions to dominate their actions and those for whom greed is taken over. Those who love only gaining the approval of others, of flattery, of power. Those who can only love self, where bitterness or hurt has made them inward looking. And we ask that you will reveal yourself to them and point them to salvation through your Son. Loving God, we pray for people we know who are sick, especially those suffering from long-term illnesses or those facing uncertainty that demands much patience to bear. We think of the people in our own congregation who are finding the road to recovery slow or frustrating. And we remember before you those who are lonely and depressed. We ask that you will make us good listeners, give us the right words and help us to know what simple acts of kindness can help someone. We pray for those who care for the people in our community, those whose calling it is to be carers. We pray, Lord, that you'll sustain them in this work. We pray for ourselves and we ask that we'll never neglect any opportunity to offer friendship or help. Teach us to be watchful for the needs of others, loving and serving them as honoured members of your family. We end our time of prayer together by saying the Lord's Prayer. And we'll use the traditional version, it's on the top of page four in Mission Praise if you have a copy of that. Uh, we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, ever and ever. Amen. Thanks, Andy. Um, now, if you've got a copy of Mission Praise, we'd like to pick it up. If not, we'll have something that will appear on the screen. But could I all ask you to please to stand as we affirm our faith in what we believe as Christians as we say the Apostles' Creed together. So together we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge God's the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And can I ask you to remain standing as we um, sing our next song, which is again praising God's greatness, and it's How Great Thou Art, after which Lynn will bring us our reading, and then Steve will come and teach us on God's Word.
This morning's reading is taken from Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 20, and it can be found on page 1182 of the Pew Bibles. The Supremacy of Christ. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning everyone. Do keep that passage open in front of you uh, and we're going to pray as we begin. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you that it teaches us things that we otherwise uh, could never know. And so Father, we do uh, pray that you would be with us as we think about what it's teaching us about your creation and your son Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, a few weeks ago, we were looking at the Apostles' Creed together, and we thought about God being the maker of heaven and earth. We thought about how God created everything there is, and he did it by speaking. We saw that it, it was good. We learned that God is not part of creation, but it has always existed. He is the creator. And we saw that God made people in his image that we might reflect something about him in the world. And I mentioned very briefly at the time that God the Father was not alone in the creation of the world, but that his son Jesus was a part of it too. And so today we get to delve further into what the Bible teaches us about that. And the reason we're, we're looking at this passage today is because we're thinking about our responsibilities as those who bear God's image. We're thinking about what it means to be stewards and caretakers of God's world. In a few weeks' time, the Climate Change Conference will be taking place, and the goal of that is to help us to think about how we live in this world in a way that protects the world and is sustainable. Now I realise that people will have different views when it comes to a topic like climate change. And I'm certainly not an expert. I don't know the extent to which climate change is or isn't happening. I don't know what may or may not be causing it. These are issues that people disagree about. I'm not a scientist, I cannot speak into those questions. But what we can do is think about what the Bible teaches us on these issues. That's what we're going to be doing for the next two weeks. Today we're going to be laying the uh, important foundations. And then next week we'll think a little more about how we live in light of it as Christians. And so we turn now to this passage from Colossians. And our first point this morning. The world belongs to Christ. The world belongs to Christ. If there's one thing that is clear in this section, it is that Christ is supreme over everything. Again and again, Paul makes this point. And he makes it in a variety of ways. He begins by making the statement that Jesus, the Son, is the image of the invisible 
But we know that God is all-powerful and all-knowing. We know that he is at work in, in every area of the world. We know that all things are in his hands. And yet, despite those things, we don't see him, do we? He's invisible. Some people use that fact to, to question things. How can you believe in a God that you can't see? But Paul says that in Jesus Christ, the vi invisible is made visible. In Christ, we see God. Well, that is mind-blowing stuff. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Well, I said at the beginning that as human beings, we're all made in God's image. But I think Paul is saying more than that here when it comes to Jesus. As humans, we display something of God's character, something of his nature. However, we're not God. That is certainly true after the fall, but it was true even before the fall, even before things went wrong. We were never God. However, Jesus is the exact representation of God. In him is the, the fullness of God. Jesus is fully God. He is a perfect image of God. And we see what it means for, for Jesus to be in the image of God as we read on. Paul has two points to make. He twice refers to Jesus as the firstborn. So firstly, he's a, the firstborn over all creation. And secondly, he's the firstborn among the dead. So in verse 15, Paul says that Christ is the firstborn over creation. Well, that's potentially a tricky phrase. Because it might sound like Paul is saying that, that Christ is the first created thing. But we know that can't be what he's saying. As we look at what Paul just said about Christ being the image of God, as we look to what he says next about Christ creating all things, we see that Christ is not part of the creation, but he, along with God, is the creator. So what does it then mean for him to be the, the firstborn over creation? Well, the idea of firstborn is that it, it signifies priority, preeminence, superiority. Often the firstborn would possess the inheritance and the responsibility of leadership. So by declaring that Jesus is the firstborn over all creation, Paul is saying that Christ has preeminence and authority over all of creation. How can Paul make such a statement? Well, verses 16 and 17 make it crystal clear. All things were created in him. That is why Christ isn't just the, the first created being. It's because everything that was created was created in him. And when Paul says all things, he really does mean all things. He created everything in heaven and everything on earth. Straight away, that, that covers everything. But just so there's no doubt, Paul goes on. He created the visible and the invisible. We're not just talking about things we can see and touch. But he created everything. So he created the mountain and the molecule. He created the stars and he created gravity. He created the physical world and the spiritual realm. He created all the animals and all the angels. He created everything. Just in case you think there's any throne or power or ruler or authority that, that might be outside of Christ's dominion. Think again. Because he created all of them as well. Even the ones that now stand against him. That's a sobering thought. Even the enemies of Christ completely rely on him for their very existence. Well, there's more. Because not only were all those things created through him, but they were created 
for him. All things find their purpose in Christ. It's not just that he's their creator, but they were created for him and for his glory. So everything finds its origin and its goal in Christ. You see, the world was not ultimately created for us, but it was created for Jesus. All that we see, all that we know, it all exists for him. Well, in verse 17 we read this, He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Christ was before all things. Before anything else existed, Christ was there. He's not just part of creation. He is its creator. And actually, it's more than just that. He's the one who's holding all things together. Without him, everything would simply fall apart. If it wasn't for Jesus' ongoing work, then time and space would simply cease to exist. That means even the rulers and authorities that stand against Christ can only do so because he is, he's upholding their very existence. Some people think that God created the world but then stood back and he's just watching to see what happens. But that is not the case. The world only exists because Christ is, is continually holding it together. Creation belongs to Christ. It is made by him and for him. And he's the one who sustains it and keeps it going. Well, in verse 18, we move on to our second point. Not only is Christ over the grandness of creation, but he's also the head over the church. And so our second point this morning, the church belongs to Christ. The church belongs to Christ. See, we must not think of Christ as this far-off power who doesn't care about the specifics of the world. Nothing could, in fact, be further from the truth. The picture Paul gives us is of a, a head and a body. Christ is the head, and his people, the church, are the body. And this shows us, I think, two things. Firstly, it shows us the closeness of the relationship. You can't get much closer than a head and a body. By being part of the church, you are, in turn, a part of Christ. He knows us intimately. And secondly, it shows us the nature of the relationship. Although we are a part of Christ, we're not the same as him. He's the head and we're the body. He's in charge. He has the authority. We belong to him. Well, Paul goes on to say that he is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. Well, it could be that Paul is saying here that Christ was the first person to truly come back from the dead. And that would be true. We, we wouldn't have an issue with that. But actually, it's more likely he is sticking with the understanding we had in verse 15. And that Paul is once again here emphasising Christ's priority and preeminence. So whereas in verse 15 we saw that Christ had superiority over creation, here now we zoom in and we see he also has superiority over those who have been raised from the dead. So here's the thing, here is the point that Paul is making. These things are all true about Jesus, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. Now on the one hand that is obvious. He's the, the son, the image of the invisible God. Of course he has the supremacy. But Paul doesn't want there to be any doubt. He wants to make sure that we, we realise there is no other contender for the crown. There can be nobody else above Christ because nobody has done the things that Christ has done. Nobody else is the person 
that Christ is. This might make you ask the question, how is this possible? How can Jesus, a man, do these things? Well, verse 19 answers, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things. Jesus isn't someone a little bit like God. He isn't a man who's been given some God-like characteristics. No. The fullness of God is in him. He is fully God. And because of that, God, through Jesus Christ, has been able to reconcile, to, to bring back to himself all things. And again, just to be clear, this really is all things. All things on earth and all things in heaven. So just as he created all things, so do, does he reconcile all things. How has he achieved this? Well, let's see the peace that comes because of the blood he shed on the cross. Creation is fixed and made right with God because of Christ's death. This is the heart of what Paul is wanting the Colossian church to know. And it's what we need to hear too. Salvation and reconciliation come through Jesus' death. We're going to uh, think about that more in a minute as we look at uh, some more verses. There is one important clarification I want to make. See, it could look like from this verse that everyone and everything is saved through Jesus' death. Some people use this verse to claim that it doesn't really matter what people do or say or believe, all are saved by Christ in the end. But that isn't what Paul is saying here, and it isn't what the Bible teaches elsewhere. So what does it then mean for him to reconcile all things to himself? Well, it means all things without distinction, rather than all things without exception. In other words, if something is going to be reconciled to God, it can only be reconciled because of Jesus. So it doesn't matter if you're a man from this country or a, a woman from that country. It doesn't matter whether you're a, a spiritual being in heaven. It doesn't matter if it's the world itself. If you're going to be reconciled to God, it is because of Christ. Here's a little silly example. Uh, if I said that everybody was welcome to St. Peter's on a Sunday, what am I saying? Well, I'm saying that it doesn't matter who you are, what you've done, what your background is, how much money you've got, all people are welcome to come. What I'm not saying is that all seven billion people in the world are welcome to come on a Sunday, because that would give us a serious seating problem. All those that want to find reconciliation can find it through Christ. You can only find it through Christ. It doesn't matter who you are or what you've done. Through Christ you can be brought back to God. When we, when we hear all this, our only response should be to say, Wow, Christ is amazing. He is bigger and better than our mind can ever truly understand. And it should stop us in our tracks if we ever think about moving on from Christ. If we're ever tempted to think that we need to go on to something deeper or better than Christ. There is nowhere else to go. Christ is supreme over everything. And if we're ever tempted to put our trust in something else, whether that be politics or, or technology or relationships, we need to remember those things only exist because Christ enables them to exist. Without Christ, they are nothing. See, Jesus is not like a TV or a phone. There isn't going to be an upgrade to a new version. In Christ we already, already have the one who is supreme above all things. 
Well, as we turn to our final point, we're going to think a little bit more about this reconciliation. And we didn't have um, the last few verses uh, read, but I want to look at them anyway. So have that Bible in front of you. We're going to look at um, a, a few verses that follow on. So our last point, reconciliation belongs to Christ. Reconciliation belongs to Christ. Well, the first part of the passage was all about Jesus, this part is all about us. Paul wrapped up the section about Christ's supremacy by mentioning it was through Christ that all things are reconciled to God. Well, here he expands on that and he makes it personal to his readers. Paul says in verse 21, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your mind because of your evil behaviour. This is why we need to be reconciled. We've been alienated, separated from God. <clears throat> we became enemies with God in both our thinking and our actions. And this is down to us. It is what we wanted. We stood up against God and we thought of him as our enemy. Because we wanted to live evil lives that were in opposition to him. And because we thought and acted like that, we did indeed become enemies with God. But Paul says the good news is that that is what Christians used to be. Verse 22, he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. To be an enemy of God is an extremely bad thing. When we go up against the one who rules over all of creation, the outcome cannot be good. We should expect a due punishment for our crime. The Bible tells us that the punishment is death. That is the reason why Christ had to physically die. We can only be made right with God when the, the punishment is dealt with. That is what Christ does for us. He died in our place. But it's more than that. It's not that we've just been given a blank slate. Through Christ we are made holy in God's sight. We are without blemish and free from accusation. When God looks on us, he no longer sees us as enemies. Instead he sees us just as he sees his perfect son. Well, this is the, the great hope that comes through Christ. If you are a Christian, then rejoice, because this is true for you. However, there is a warning in verse 23. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. These things are only true if you continue to have faith in Christ. We may be tempted to move on from Christ. We may think that there's a deeper spiritual truth to be found. The gospel was all well and good when I became a Christian, but it's a bit simplistic for me now. I need something else. But Paul says, no. We don't need to move on from Christ. He is supreme. He's able to meet all of our needs. And in fact, Paul doesn't just say that we don't need to move on. He says that we must not. Only through faith in Christ can we be reconciled to God. This is the gospel that we know and have heard. It is the same gospel that's proclaimed all around the world. It's the gospel that Paul dedicated his life to and became a servant of. But what does all this then tell us about how we live in this world? Let me draw out a, a few things as we finish. The passage tells us that the world belongs to Christ. He made it. He sustains it. It is for him. This means he has certain rights over it. If I were to build a Lego model, it would be up to me to choose what I did with it. If I wanted to put it on a shelf and never touch it again, I could. If I wanted to give it to my children and say... Have it, play with it, do what you want with it. I could. 
I, if I wanted to, I could give it to them and say, I built this, I made it. It's mine. I want it back. But for a little while, I'll let you play with it. As long as you look after it. The world belongs to Christ, therefore he can decide what happens to it. And he has entrusted it to our care. God calls us to take care of the world, to rule over it and subdue it. This doesn't mean we can do whatever we want with it. It is not ours to abuse. We're supposed to make it better, not worse. Jesus has the right to tell, tell us how to look after the world because it belongs to him. And this is actually even more the case if we're Christians because the church belongs to him as well. And so there's an extra responsibility for Christians to live rightly in this world. We cannot bury our heads in the sand and say that it's nothing to do with us. We must think very carefully about how we live in this world. And we must always try to please Christ in all that we do. And I would suggest that whatever we think about climate change, that producing obscene amounts of pollution and waste, is not a good thing to do. We must do better. And let me finish by making an important point. It is not our job to save the world. There's only one person who can save the world, and that is Jesus. Of course, there are things we can and should do to make things better. And yes, there's things we should avoid that make it worse. But at the end of the day, we live in a broken world. And no matter how well we do, or how many improvements we make, we'll never make it perfect. But Jesus can, and he is. He started that process when he died on the cross, and he'll bring it to completion when he returns. On that day, the heavens and the earth will be made new, and all the bad things in this world will be no more. There is, of course, much more that could be said, and we will return to think more about it next week. But the message to take away this week is that we live in a world that is not ours. It was made by Christ and for Christ. In every way, it belongs to him. And therefore, the way we live and the way we treat the world should reflect that. As followers of Christ, we should be known as people who look after and care for the world. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he created all things. We thank you that even now he's holding all things together. We thank you that he is supreme over everything, over creation and over the church as well. Thank you that you allow us to live in this world, that you give us responsibilities to look after this world. And we are sorry for the ways in which we have not done that rightly. We're sorry for the ways that we've made the world worse, particularly as we think about uh, the waste and pollution that we contribute. Father, we uh, pray that we would change Pray that we would change the way we think and change the way we act. We pray that you would guide us in our thinking as we think over the next week and over the many months and years ahead, that you'd help us uh, to live rightly as Christians in your world. Well, thanks, uh, Lynn, for reading that passage in to Steve for teaching us on God's Word. Uh, so, we now come to our final song, which is Hear the Call of the Kingdom. And this is about Jesus coming to earth and making peace through his blood that was shed on the cross, so that we could be reconciled with God, as Steve just talked about. So, can we all please stand and sing, Hear the Call of the Kingdom.
please do sit down. Um, before we finish, uh, there are a couple of notices. Um, to remind the men of the church, the Midlands Men's Convention, uh, Making a Difference, Godly Men in a Godless World, is taking place at the Cornerstone Church in Nottingham on Saturday the 6th of November. Tickets are £15 and concessions are £10. Um, one other thing, um, for those of you who know, uh, Betty G passed away on Friday morning, so um, prayers to her family. Um, also, if you haven't managed to get a new sheet, there are some available at the back, as are the prayer diaries. So, if we can just now say a final prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray for peace in a world of war, food in a world of starvation, light in a world of darkness, and hope in a world of despair. May you guide us to what is right, and forgive us if we are wrong. Help us to look forward to the future and let us not repeat mistakes of the past. Let us be grateful for every new day and all that it brings for us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Tea and coffee is served at the back of the church if you'd like to stay and have a chat.